community commerce, alternative economies, and other emergent models. The gift economy. The gift economy is a system of sharing and freely giving resources to one another with no expectation of a return. While this may seem out of touch as a concept, the internet is the primary example of the gift economy where information, services, and social capital are exchanged in a vibrant economy of free exchange. This book itself is offered for free digital download on my site, for example, and I offer daily posts, videos, teaching, and more for free online as well. In many areas, the gift economy is outcompeting the market and barter economy. The best example is the music industry. Music is now free through online services with advertisements embedded, or nearly free through streaming services that offer astonishingly large libraries of music for negligible costs. MIT and Harvard courses are now being streamed online for public access. Information is becoming free as our communication networks decentralize, interconnect, and collaborate exponentially. The Third Industrial Revolution A book and concept put forth by Jeremy Rifkin, The Third Industrial Revolution, TIR, is already upon us in many ways and being adopted as policy moving forward in China, the EU, parts of South America, and many other parts of the world. It is a vision of a post-carbon world decentralized and laterally composed in contrast to today's top-down hierarchical design powered by fossil fuel. The basic premise is that the internet is the first step in the third industrial revolution. It is decentralized, people-powered, and social capital-based. Once energy and transportation join communication in the TIR, the end of the petrochemical second industrial revolution will be complete. Our cultures and economies will be plugged into a decentralized alternative energy grid with laterally shared energy communication and transportation. Once we do that, we will be able to pay off the infrastructural investments within decades if not years. It is a road for a debt-free society. The sun is always shining, the wind is always blowing, and the tides are always changing. Currently, since the world markets and economies are fundamentally linked to oil, the price of oil affects everything and since it is running out and the price will rise out of reach in time despite current consumer prices, all the largest economies and markets of the world are stagnating and in decline because of this clear fact. They will be outcompeted by businesses and countries with businesses plugged into a decentralized and alternative energy grid. The efforts of Rifkin's organizations currently are to create master plans for select international cities focused on the TIR mission, to generate ways to bring the decentralized grids online as fast as possible and in as many areas as possible, and to influence all nations to adopt these concepts. Despite it sounding like a political battle, the TIR concepts are being widely adopted all over the world. They are a sure path out of debt and into a regenerative economy. The third industrial revolution concept is detailed and holistic. It cannot be covered here in detail. Companies. When people join together for a common goal or vision, they literally form a company. That is the root of all business, to fulfill a goal of common purpose or need. Today, companies fall into several groups, sole proprietorship, one owner, general proprietorship, two or more partner owners, corporations, shareholders own the company, and limited liability or limited partnerships. These combine different aspects of the other types. Each type has its own advantages and disadvantages, with many of the most successful businesses, present and past, receiving criticism for abusing both people and the environment. In general, our economy relies upon the extraction of natural resources and their transformation into marketable products. Industrialization over time has exponentially increased the liquidation of the natural world. Despite this trend and proclivity, companies can be ethical because in the end they are simply a group of like-minded people who, if ethically aligning themselves with their bioregion socially and ecologically, can be regenerative. There are several examples of companies that are regenerative. Ethics can overlay any company type and make it a regenerative part of any community.
Entropy versus Centropy. Entropy is the thermodynamic concept that states that energy is always lost in each exchange, leading to the eventual diffusion of that energy until it is no longer identifiable. It is the idea that all order is continuously breaking down into disorder. Syntropy, from Greek meaning cross-feeding, is the idea that disorder turns into order infinitely in a properly designed natural ecosystem. Natural systems, or syntropic systems, will always expand upon the amount of life and complexity given even the smallest amount of opportunity. Life begets life. The current economic model, a scarcity model, is based on entropy and not on an abundance model. The more businesses that begin to operate syntropically, the faster our current system will transition into a regenerative economy. Return on investment, ROI, through a permaculture lens. Much like an energy audit, the ROI determines how profitable a venture is. Knowing how much was invested in contrast to how much profit was made exposes clearly the strength and success of a business with a simple metric. In nature, you must make a return of surplus back to the system, to minerals, energy, organic matter, nutrients, and water cycling. In a business based on natural systems, the surplus is divided and returned to the business itself, the workers of that business, the environment and soils the business relies upon, and the customers that continue to support the business financially. Local equals bioregional. The local economy should be the primary or foundational economy. The more local, the closer to home, the better. Food, fuel, fiber, and water should all be sourced as locally as possible. The decentralization of basic utilities and needs strengthens communities' resilience while it boosts the local economy. Entrepreneurism and innovation within a stable larger economy depend on the existence of vibrant local markets. Face-to-face -face interactions between the business owners and customers, transparency of business practices, and a sense of community. All these can happen at the local scale, but are more difficult to maintain at the industrial level. Because of this, Properly managed small businesses are more effective at serving their communities and maintaining an integrity over the long term. We need the local butcher, baker, shoemaker, repairman, compost expert, seed saver, and more specialized vocations per region. The old crafts and trades of our ancestors, what defined their lives and passions, are returning. As ethical people seek out ways to avoid consuming fossil fuels. The online communities we form can work with our online businesses in much the same ways as local communities do with local businesses. They are leveraging technologies through webinars, video chats, regular pictures, blogs, or podcasts to maintain an intimate connection with their customer base. Commuting. Commuting must end. The average daily U.S. commute to work is 25 minutes long, which is a huge waste of time and natural resources, transporting people all over to do work they should be doing in their own community. The future is going to have less and less meaningless travel. It will instead be meaningful and occur less often. Telecommuting will continue to spread as well. This cuts down on costs for everyone and supports communities where they are. Currency. Local currencies are fast becoming a new American phenomenon with the Ithaca Hour Dollar, the Coastal Marine Fund, the Portland Bartering Economy, but their roots are ancient and multicultural. When local goods are purchased with local currencies, it keeps funds in the community and can lower taxation. Tying local production to a local currency also protects that local industry from industrialized competition allowing for entrepreneurism and craftsmanship to flourish locally. The first local currency, the Ithaca Hour, was started by Paul Glover in 1991, equivalent to 10 US dollars or an hour of work. The hour is based on historical accounts Glover read about where a British industrialist would let it workers earn, quote, hours to spend at the company store. Though the hour went into decline with Glover leaving the town of Ithaca, the currency still endures, and the model remains a strong one. LETs, local exchange trading systems, are systems that create a secondary economy or exchange of goods and services independent of the monetary economy. 
the Let's operates as a bookkeeping nonprofit organization to assist the members. The Brixton Pound was launched in 2009 as a local currency in the United Kingdom as part of the Transition Town movement. Bitcoin is a digital currency system that is peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized. It is run using an encrypting software that no one controls. It has no intermediaries and optional transaction fees. It is a free market but requires money initial to buy but requires money initially to buy Bitcoin credits. It behaves like a local currency would only. It exists internationally through the internet. Microloans, microinsurance, and microfranchises. Microlending is the practice of loaning very small amounts of money to low-income individuals using adapted risk management methodologies instead of collateral. These are amounts that no commercial bank has any interest in dealing with but are critical to impoverished individuals, businesses, and families. Starting out as an experiment in Bangladesh, Muhammad Yunus created the Grameen Bank, the first microcredit bank, with a focus on lending to impoverished women because, as Yunus says in a PBS interview, they, quote, give immediate attention to children and have longer vision, end quote. He discovered that over 98% of the loans were paid back, while for his customers, there was an increase in savings and profit. His work especially benefited women, children, and women's enterprises. In 2006, Muhammad won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. Microinsurance follows the same principles of adaptation to the conditions of low-income households, and microinsurance is most often applied automatically as added security for lenders. In order to make financial sense, microinsurance policies tend to be contracted village by village in Asia. Communities can pool resources or money to protect themselves against crop failures, illnesses, or the expense related to family members passing away. The small contributions add up and mitigate risk faced by the members of each group. Applying the same idea to franchise businesses, micro-franchises help impoverished individuals, especially women, become literate in business models, marketing, going door to door, selling merchandise, managing a kiosk or stall, and more. For people from small villages with limited experience and education, having a model to follow like a franchise can be a powerful guide and learning tool. This concept of scaling down to include and care for all people is powerful. We can apply this in all communities to reach and serve all peoples with our design services and businesses. Formal and informal economies. The formal economy of paper money has always had an informal counterpart. Bartering, the gift economy, public food forests and gardens, seed and food swaps, free food stands, neighborhood libraries, etc. The informal economy provides stability so that we are not dependent on the formal economy alone. The informal economy is the safety net for our cultures. During the U.S. Depression of the 1930s, the informal economy helped many families survive. When money was scarce, food was still plentiful on a farm or homestead. NPOs, nonprofit organizations. NPOs can be charities, cooperatives, or mission driven businesses designed for a public or social environmental good. Guided by a mission statement and a board of directors, these organizations rely upon donations, grants, volunteers, and tax exemption. They can be easier or harder to set up depending on where you are. In some countries like the US and UK, they are easy to register, but they can take time in other areas, especially if the objectives include co-owning land. They may or may not make a profit. Most MPOs return any surplus back to their operation in order to develop additional programming and actions mandated by their mission. MPOs in the fields of regenerative agriculture, permaculture, and restoration projects will typically share surplus production that arises from abundance. Cooperatives, co-ops, buying clubs. When groups get together, form a new organization and pool responsibility for the management of a communal benefit like lower prices or organic foods in an urban food desert, they are forming a cooperative organization. These range in their purpose and their actions, but they all involve people cooperatively owning and doing the work to run the business or pooling their resources to get better products for lower prices. Crowdfunding. Kickstarter, GoFundMe, Indiegogo, Barnraiser, and many other crowdfunding platforms offer entrepreneurs, artists, authors, and individuals a place online to legally raise money. 
connecting demand directly to innovation and production. Startups get the feedback and funding they need to have a successful start. While not entirely a local tool, it behaves like a local one in terms of connecting the consumer to the producer or the funder to the project. CSAs. Community Supported Agriculture CSA programs are where customers directly support farmers and ranchers by buying shares of the farmer's produce for that season or year at the beginning of the season and sometimes throughout. In return, the farmers then provide weekly, bi-weekly, monthly fruit, vegetables, dairy, meat, or any combination thereof. In the future, this could also include energy and fuel. Membership in these community-supported programs usually starts with a down payment early in the growing season to support the farmer while most of the food is still on the ground. And sometimes, this is a deposit you can get back. Payments can happen monthly, weekly, or annually upfront depending on the farm. CSAs are like crowdfunding programs for farmers. Farm Share Farms Farm share farms apply the concept of the CSA and crowdfunding to the land, facilities, and startup capital needed to run a farm. Participants invest several thousand dollars for a share in the farm in exchange for below wholesale pricing on all the farm produce, which ideally would be all the food needs of their community of supporters. These can be organized with a representative board of shareholders that manages and directs the farm as well as providing reports to the supporters and including them in the decision-making process. Shareholders can form businesses around the products they receive if these are abundant enough, or they can buy multiple shares in the farm share to facilitate the development of a business. Permaculture teacher, designer, and humanitarian aid worker Jeff Lawton has been working on setting these up in Australia, Japan, and the United States. These farms have animals and plants, and they have very little waste as they feed and fertilize with what they generate on site. Stacked careers or products. By stacking functions in a system, we can increase the yield of the original unit of land. The same can be done with our time, careers, and even our company's products. We can do two things at once, like visiting our grandmother and pruning her fruit trees for cuttings. We can work jobs that work together like seed saving and farming or physical therapy and yoga. Or we can make products that work together in some way like seeds with a gardening book. Leading examples. Guayaki Yerba Mate Company. Yerba Mate is a rainforest holly vine found in South America and used to brew a hot tea that is unique and energizing. It is a traditional cultural drink that represents the bioregion from which it comes. It is a symbiotic plant which aptly captures the spirit of Guayaki's business practices. Guayaki is an example of a company trying to do everything to the highest ethical standards possible. The company partners with Atlantic rainforest communities in South America to sustainably harvest yerba mate and actively restore the rainforest. They are certified organic and fair trade. Their metallic packaging is compostable. Their offices use solar power. They offset their carbon footprint, sequestering over 55 tons of carbon. Their marketing is viral and largely carried out by fans of the company and their drinks. By leveraging market demand for ethical energizing drinks, Guayaki has created a powerfully regenerative business and community. It is a model that is scalable and replicable. Quote, Our mission is to steward and restore 200,000 acres, 81,000 hectares of South American Atlantic rainforest and create over 1,000 living wage jobs by 2020 by leveraging our market-driven restoration business model. End quote. Guayaki.com. Fiber Shed. With a focus on carbon sequestration and local textile networks, Fibershed, the nonprofit organization, was founded by Rebecca Burgess to educate the public on the environmental, economic, and social benefits of decentralizing the textile supply chain. Shortly after Burgess's project began in 2010, it inspired a worldwide movement based around the new term Fibershed, which sounded by original like a watershed but clearly focused on the entire garment life cycle. If all our garments and fibers were grown and processed locally, an enormous amount of pollution and unethical labor would be erased from the world. 
Fibershed develops regional and regenerative fiber systems on behalf of independent working producers. By expanding opportunities to implement carbon farming, forming catalytic foundations to rebuild regional manufacturing, and through connecting end users to farms and ranches through public education. Our mission and vision, Fibershed.com.